There we go. All right, so uh, we'll be talking about portions. We're going to be talking about yields. We're going to be talking about portion cost. Okay, so a lot of this is it's really practical because you can immediately take this stuff. Uh, you, can, you can take this stuff and immediately apply it, uh, either in industry, uh, you know, in an externship, uh, in your own life, you know, if you wanted to cost out a particular recipe or a portion. Okay, so pretty practical stuff. I'm going to be showing you a worksheet, or the worksheet we're going over today is something that um, my prep cooks would use every single day in my kitchens, okay, uh, called a yield test. But we'll, we'll, we'll get there, okay? So, without further ado, so we're going we're gonna to go over some just uh, some definitions here, okay? And, um, and yeah, so for the first one is a butcher test, okay? A butcher test is a, is a test. It's, it's pretty much a form or almost a worksheet, if you will, uh, that we use to determine the standard portion cost for products that are portioned before cooking. Okay, what are some examples of products that we would portion before we cook them? Uh, giving you a bit of a hint, it, pretty much anything that needs to be butchered or clean, right? So what are some, uh, some products that we would have in a restaurant that need to be butchered or cleaned? Absolutely, fine. Meat? Meat needs to, what is it? Uh, some poultry? Absolutely. Steak? Yes. I mean, uh, uh, what is it? We had um, prime rib uh, on our menu. Uh, we had to uh, take off some of the fat and cut out some of the bones. Uh, steaks. We had um, I forget what which steak, what kind of steak it was. It was a petite, a petite fillet. No, it wasn't a petite fillet. I forget the cut, but it was it was a steak that had uh, had silver skin on it, right? So we had to. We had to take some skill, the silver skin off. Okay, what about, uh, and poultry as well, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. You got to debone uh, in some cases, some uh, some chickens, right? Salmon, fish, absolutely. To make a salmon fillet, uh, if you get your fish whole, you got to, you got to, um, you got to fillet it. You got to, uh, you can't serve it on the head. You know, got to pull out the, uh, what is it, bones if necessary, you know, and then cut it up. Absolutely. Okay, all good examples. So pretty much anything that really needs to be butchered. Okay, so we perform the test on those products to identify the portion cost. Okay, now the reason we do that is because we can't use 100% of those those items, right? You can't use 100% of a salmon if you come in it in whole. <coughs> well, then again, you could you could argue with me. I mean, you you could use the head and the bones for some fish stock, but I'm not sure about the the innards, right? So we can't necessarily use 100% of those products. And because we can't use 100% of those products, it affects the portion cost or the unit cost, if you will. All right. Next is the cooking loss test. Okay. Now this is very similar to the butcher test. Okay. This is a test used to determine the standard portion cost for products that are portioned after they're cooked. Okay. So what are some items that we would portion after it's cooked? Vegetables. Yes. Prime rib, absolutely, Nicholas. That's a big one. Meat again. Yep, absolutely. Um, those are the main ones, really. Okay. Um, what is it called? Uh, how would I mention? How, how would I? Yeah. It's it's usually your 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 high price or high cost items. Okay. That again have a yield factor. Okay. And then that's the next definition I want to go over. So the yield factor, as a, you know, a a, a as a rigid definition is the ratio of the weight of the part of a product to the weight it was purchased at. Okay, so that's kind of confusing, right? A yield factor, or uh, as we say in industry, just a yield, okay? Uh, it's a percentage, but a percentage of a product that is actually usable, right? We had mentioned that with some products we have to, we have to butcher or we have to clean or uh, things like that, the piece uh, that we're left with is the usable portion. Now, the usable portion, uh, as a percentage of the original portion, is the yield, right? So, for example, an onion, right? Can you use 100% of an onion? No, absolutely not. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta clean it first, right? You gotta, you gotta chop the root, gotta take, take off a, a layer of uh, the onion, 
and then based on that you have some stuff that you can't use right so you cannot use a hundred percent of an onion what percentage of an onion do you think you could use yeah it depends on the onion right <laughs> it depends on the onion um, uh, but yeah anywhere you know 90 uh, ninety-five percent. Okay, now that is what we'd say is the yield. Okay, that's because we can actually use that portion of the product, but it's not a hundred percent. What are some other products that we would have in our kitchen? I mean, at home, right? Uh, uh, think about what's in your fridge. What products in your fridge can you not use a hundred percent of? Eggs, yeah, pretty much everything. You're right. Um, there's only a few products that you can use 100% of. For example, like most liquids will tend to have 100% um, yield, like broth, uh, cooking wine, milk, cream, things like that, right? Uh, even alcoholic beverages, that those products will have a yield of 100%. Most food products, though, uh, will not, right? Uh, for example, uh, lettuce. We can't use 100% of lettuce. We got to chop off the bottom, right? Carrots. We got to we got to peel the or skin the carrot. We got to chop off the root. So we can't use 100% of most products. So the yield is a really important thing when it comes into calculating your portion cost for a particular ingredient, right? Um, because and this is going to sound funky right now, as the amount of a product is decreasing because it has a yield. Holding the original uh, uh, cost the same, the price proportion or the price per unit must increase. Okay, if we didn't take into consideration the yield when calculating our portion cost, our recipe costs would be incorrect. Okay, and we base uh, we we use our recipe costs for a lot of things, right? For example, uh, it, it has implications in pricing, right? Um, it has implications in break even, as we had shown. You know, like a product's uh, or a dish's uh, contribution margin is the sales price minus the the directly variable costs, which would be the recipe cost. So these are kind of important things. Okay. Now, while most products we can calculate the portion cost fairly easily using the yield factor if we knew it, some products are kind of finicky, and that's why we use the butcher test and the cooking loss test to really get at the yield for specific um, uh, for specific items, for example, fish or prime rib, because each of those uh, products are not all the they're, they're 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 different, right? For example, some bones might be bigger than others. Okay, uh, one prime rib might have more fat than another. Uh, a fish uh, might be smaller than another. You know, so we have to do these things um, in order to arrive at a specific yield for those products and calculate the true portion cost. Okay. Does anybody have any questions before we continue? All right. Uh, so before we even get to calculating the portion cost, we have to we have to establish some standards for our our products and our menu items, right? For a particular menu item, okay. Uh, the recipe should be, uh, or sorry, every time we make a specific uh, menu item, it should be identical uh, with another, uh, with the same item uh, in five different ways, right? Every time we make a specific dish, okay, the types of ingredients that go into the dish should be sa the same, right? The proportion of those ingredients should also be the same, okay? We should be pre preparing specific dishes in the same, uh, using the same method every single time. It should produce a specific quantity of a, uh, of a product. And when we plate it and send it out to a guest, it should always look, uh, it should always look the same, right? We eat with our eyes. So every time you make a dish on a specific menu, it should be identical or it should uh, it should be yeah it should be identical uh, in regards to these five things right otherwise every time you make a specific dish on your menu it's going to come out looking different it's going to come out tasting different it's going to come out uh, bigger or smaller right um, 
for example, think of, think of, uh, put yourself in a customer's shoes, right? Let's say that our cooks were not following these standards, right? Um, let's say I, you're a guest and you come into a restaurant and you order a salad for lunch that has a, um, has a, uh, let's say, uh, a four ounce salmon on top, okay, of a, on a, on a chopped salad, okay? Now, let's say in your chopped salad there's there's chickpeas right and there's uh, there's four ounce there's a four ounce salmon on top of your chopped salad so you come in you eat it you love it okay uh, and then you come back the next day for lunch and you, you order the same thing now on the second day let's say there's no chickpeas in the salad okay let's also say that instead of the the salmon instead of being four ounces it's now two ounces Based on those two things, A, are you as a customer happy, and B, which two things on my list of five here did the cook not follow? Remember, there was, there was no chickpeas. And the, uh, the there was a, a two ounce salmon instead of four. Yeah, so there was no chickpeas. Okay. Uh, so the type of ingredients there was no there was no chickpeas, and there was a two ounce salmon instead of uh, a four ounce salmon. So uh, it had a smaller proportion of the ingredient. Right now, based on these two things. Uh, it's also affected the quantity, right? There's probably less salad now. Okay, so your previous experience, you had chickpeas in your salad, and you had a uh, you had a four ounce salmon, and you loved it. Now you've come back in, and you've gotten this salad, no chickpeas, uh, and now a two ounce salmon. Are you, as a customer, happy or pissed off? Not happy, exactly. So this has uh, implications if we don't follow these five things every time we make a specific dish, um, then we're going to uh, have unhappy guests. Now what happens when your guests aren't happy? Yeah, there's complaints, absolutely. Uh, you would never go back. These are some of the things or, or the possible areas that can affect customer satisfaction and customer loyalty, right? As customer satisfaction and customer loyalty goes down, you know, uh, people stop coming to our restaurant because we, <laughs> they won't like our food or we're not consistent with it, right? You know, as the amount of guests we're serving is going down, we're losing money or our profit is going down. So... Every time your cooks or you are making a specific dish, you should be adhering to the standards for that dish. Okay, and these would be the, those five standards. Now, these things, when you bring them all together, create what we call standard recipes. Okay, a standard recipe is a recipe that's been created for a particular dish and uh, it tells cooks exactly how to make that dish. It will have the proportion of the ingredients. It will have the amount of the oh, sorry. It will have the amount of the ingredients, the type of ingredients, the cooking method, any relevant temperatures. It'll include a picture most times that I've seen, <coughs> and it is designed so that every time a cook makes a dish, it's going to come out looking, tasting and appearing the same way, okay? If you're adhering to those five standards, you will also have create what we call standard portion sizes. This is the size of each of the portion of ingredients that go into that specific dish, okay? For example, um, in a recipe, you might have 100 grams of onions, okay? The 100 grams of onions is the standard portion size, okay? Now, if we know the standard portion sizes and the, the cost of the ingredient, we can calculate our standard portion costs, which is what one portion of a product should 
cost. Okay. Now, while we're not going to get into it today, it is the sum of your portion costs within a recipe or a standard recipe that creates your recipe cost. Okay, we'll be go you'll be going over that uh, after intercession. But today, we're focusing on the first step in doing that, uh, which is calculating your portion cost. And again, the yield for your product is exceptionally important in doing that. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about standard portion sizes, recipes, or portion costs before I uh, continue? Awesome. There we go. So, how do we communicate our portion sizes? Right. There are three ways to quantify uh, portion sizes and items. Okay. Obviously. Uh, the first one is is weight, right? We can use grams, and as an extension of grams, we can use kilograms. We can also use ounces. Okay, um, we would use this measurement uh, for meats, fish, and vegetables. Okay, but what about liquids? Okay, so look down my list here. What would what 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 of the last two kinds of uh, ways would you use to measure liquids? Yes, liters, milliliters, fluid ounces, all of those are examples of, uh, or measures of volume, okay? Um, we always measure liquids in volume, okay? Um, these examples of this are, 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 are soups, juices, uh, milk, um, alcoholic beverages, all of these are measured in volume, okay? However, sometimes it's easier to measure some items in case of things, okay? So on your standard recipe, okay, um, let's say you're, you're portioning shrimp for a shrimp linguine, okay? Is it easier to measure out 14 shrimp or 56.725 uh, 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 grams of shrimp? Which would be easier for you to prep? The first one, exactly, counts. Okay, we can uh, use counts and other products as well, like bacon, okay, eggs, right? You would never give, <laughs> you would never, you would never put on your menu. Uh, my eggs Benny is served with uh, 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 thirty-six point two seven ounces, or sorry, yeah, uh, ounces of eggs. You would say my eggs Benny is served with two eggs. <laughs> uh, it's much easier to count, right? Okay, Trust shrimp and oranges are all other examples, right? Um, so these are all the ways that we can quantify um, our products, so the, the amount of product in both our menu items, um, our dishes, uh, and our portion sizes, okay? Does anybody have any questions about these uh, three ways to measure our products? No, good, fairly straightforward. So going back to standard recipes. As I mentioned, standard recipes oh. are recipes that are created for a particular menu, okay? Um, and it takes into consideration uh, each product's yield, okay? On a standard recipe, you will have the ingredients and the amount of each ingredient that goes into making the dish, okay? The production method for that specific dish, for example, saute, broil, bake, uh, things like that, toast, okay? It'll list any specific equipment you need to, uh, uh, to make that particular dish. For example, um, you, uh, you know, you, technically you could make a panini on, on a, a flat top, but most paninis, uh, we use panini presses. So it'll list the specific equipment that you use to make the dish. Otherwise, you know, your, your cooks or you might use the wrong piece of equipment, right? And any specific temperatures that are relevant to the dish. For example, um, anything that goes in, in the oven needs to have a very specific temperature at which it goes into the oven, okay? Uh, I think I had mentioned before that I am a terrible baker, 
And one of the reasons I am a terrible baker is because I'm terrible with uh, temperatures, okay? Or at least my oven is. My oven, I don't know, my oven has a kind of its own. <laughs> um, I should really get a thermometer and really check to see how accurate it is. Anyway, so all of these things, or if we follow all of these things on standard recipes, every time we make a, a particular dish, it's going to come out, look the same, it's going to come taste the same, it's going to come out in the same quantity, things like that. Okay. Um, I think from my experience in industry, I'm trying to figure out which one of these four is 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 easier to not do correctly. Well, if we don't portion it out our products properly, then the quantity of those products going into the dish is going to correct. Okay. Um, if we don't uh, Let's say, uh, yeah, I guess it would be, that's the the one I see, uh, oh, temperatures as well, okay, so in some cases, uh, cooks don't follow the, the proper temperature and it comes out of a very different dish, uh, for example, um, pastas, okay, um, pastas can be reduced too much, uh, especially if you cook on height, uh, things like that, so standard recipes, are good for us as chefs because it, uh, when we create them, and you will have to create standard recipes when you're when you're a chef, um, it tells your staff this is how you cook my dish and this is how you should cook my dish every single time. Okay, does anybody have any questions about standard recipes? Right up. Right. So calculating your portion costs. Um, calculating portion costs, you could do calculate your portion costs four different ways. Okay, um, some are easier than others. Well, not easier, I would say. Uh, I'd say some are more useful than others. Okay, for example, uh, for example, uh, the formula I'd say is. Um, it can be useful, but it needs to include the yield. Okay, this also applies to the recipe detail and cost card, which I'll talk about a sec in a second. And then we can also do use the butcher test and cooking loss test to calculate the standard portion cost for things that are portioned at different times. For example, uh, before it's cooked, we would use the butcher test, and after it's cooked, we would use the cooking loss test. Right. Um, otherwise, uh, the formula is pretty good, and I advocate for the formula and the cost card uh, quite often. And I will show you how to do that. So the formula, okay. One formula that you can apply to calculate the cost of an individual portion of product, if you take the purchase price per unit and divide it by the amount of portions that that uh, particular product will make, it will give you the cost of the portion, right? So for example, let's say we bought a, a, uh, a bag of onions, okay? And we paid $30 for that bag of onions, okay? Let's also say that in that bag of onions, there are 90 onions, okay? If we take 30, oh. divide it by 90, we get uh, 33 cents, uh, yeah, 33, 30, 33 cents per onion, right? A quick little example here. Let's say, let's say you buy a, a dozen eggs. So you buy eggs. Okay. What eggs? I don't know. Has, has anyone bought eggs recently? I did. Uh, <laughs> no frills. I, I paid roughly four bucks. Okay. So I paid I paid four bucks for uh, a dozen eggs. Okay. So there were twelve eggs in my uh, my carton. Is that what it's called? Twelve eggs. What is the cost per egg? We'll plot the formula here. What's our cost per egg? Yeah, exactly. It's it's oddly enough, this never happens. It's thirty three cents again because we took four dollars and we divided it by twelve eggs. We get thirty three cents per egg. Okay. Now, what if uh, sorry, what if you're looking at this this um, this this cost uh, this formula here? What does this formula not take into consideration? 
or explicitly take into consideration. Yes, absolutely, the yield, okay? So when if you're using this particular formula, okay, when you're dividing uh, the number of portions that you should be including here should be the amount of portions that must take into consideration the yield. Otherwise, this will be the cost per portion that doesn't take into consideration the yield. Um, and to do that, let's say, what's a product? What's a product that, well, someone give me an example of a product that has a yield percentage of less than 100%. Okay, awesome. Artichoke. Now, what kind of Nicholas? What what kind of what kind of? <laughs> that's okay, Francis. Don't worry about it. Uh, what, what kind of yield percentage do you think uh, an artichoke would have? Twenty percent. Okay. Twenty percent. Okay. Now, how how much do you think uh, an artich an artichoke weighs in grams, roughly? It doesn't have to be perfect. Just give me a guesstimate. Yeah, okay. And let's say, yeah, so one artichoke weighs roughly 120 grams. Okay. What, based on this yield percentage and this as purchased weight, if we multiply the two together, okay, so we're going to multiply these two. Everyone in your calculators multiply 120 by 0 0.2 or 20%. Yeah, we get 24 grams. Okay, we multiply the two. That means uh, that means an artichoke that weighs roughly 120 grams and has a yield percentage of 20%. We can really only use 24 grams of uh, that particular um, of that particular product, right? Now let's say uh, for argument, like just for example purposes, let's say we put um, let's say we put ten grams of artichoke in uh, in a salad. I know it's a bad example, but just run with me right now, okay? How many portions is one? Uh, how many ten ounce portions? Of, uh, of uh, artichoke will 24 grams give you? Roughly, yeah, Nicholas, but if we, if we if we really do the math, so we take 24, yeah, 24.4. So we've taken 24 grams and we're dividing it by 10 grams because uh, our portion size is 10 grams and we get uh, 2.4. So we have 2.4 10 ounce portions, sorry, 10 gram portions of artichoke. Okay. Now, uh, how much do you think an artichoke costs, roughly? Okay. You can even just give me a, a quick little guess. Let's say an artichoke costs three dollars. Okay. I don't know that it does, but that's Let's call that. Let's say our artichoke costs three dollars. Yield should be deducted from the weight or not. Uh, uh, how do you mean? I'm not quite sure. I understand the question. Uh, no. So. Um, if you take 120 and you minus the 24, that would give you the amount of the product that uh, is not is not usable that that you're throwing away pretty much. The 24 grams or the 24 in your uh, your little calculation there, 24 is 24 grams that you can actually use. Awesome. Does that help answer your question? Okay. If not, we we'll go over another example later. Okay. So now let's apply this uh, the this equation 
to our little example here. Okay, our yes, yield means usable. Uh, so we're taking our three dollar cost per artichoke and we're dividing it by uh, the amount of portions we can make. So we can make 2.4 10 ounce portions. Now, everyone put that into calculator. What do you get? What's our cost per portion here? Exactly. A dollar and 25 cents. So, yes, we can use this formula in calculating the portion cost. However, the number of portions. Uh, that we're dividing by needs to take into consideration the yield, okay, which is the example that we just went over, okay, um, and we'll get more and we'll, we'll do another example if that was uh, a, a little quick, but does anybody have any questions uh, right now? Awesome. So, Now we're going to talk about the recipe detail and cost card. Okay, when you're creating dishes from standard recipes, which you all should be doing, it's possible to determine the standard cost of a portion using a little form that we have called the recipe detail and cost card. Okay, next week or after intercession, you will be using a recipe detail and cost card to cost out a recipe. Okay, um, and really all essentially it is. Is it's your it, it's a form that lists the amount uh, the uh, the ingredients that are in the dish, the amount of those ingredients in the dish, okay, the cost per unit, and the and uh, the cost proportion, which is the extension, okay. And all you're doing here is multiplying the quantity by the cost and arriving at the extension or the 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 uh, the, the portion cost. But again. Um, this cost needs to take into consideration the yield, okay, which we'll show you in a second. Okay. So here's how we calculate the yield percentage. Okay. It's one thing to, I mean, in, in our heads, we can we can we can kind of guesstimate what a yield would be for a specific product, but in many cases we can we want to calculate it ourselves to arrive at an accurate yield, especially for your high priced item. Okay, and how we do that to calculate our yield, okay, we take the edible portion of the product, so this is the portion of the product that is actually usable, and we divide it by the as purchased portion, okay, do that, you will get your yield percentage. When, uh, just a, a quick little definition thing here, when you see EP, so EP means edible portion okay and AP means as purchased okay so let's say we get us we get a we get a really big fish in a really big fish okay and let's say this fish weighed 10 kilograms when it came into our restaurant okay and that means our our fish weighed 10 kilograms as purchased let's say we clean it up a little bit so we we uh, we fillet it to some degree, okay, and when we weigh it after it's been cleaned, it now weighs nine kilograms again because we can't use 100% of this fish, okay. If uh, that nine kilo nine kilograms is the edible portion, if we take nine divided by ten, we get 0 0.9 or 90%. This is the yield, and it means that only 90% of that product was usable, okay. Let's do another example here. Okay, so let's say what's uh, a good example. Let's say one crab. Okay, so one crab, let's say, weighs 300 grams. Okay, so you, your crab weighs 300 grams. It's a big crab. Okay, now you don't you you use the meat. Of the crab, okay, from the legs and the claws, okay, um, but that's really all you can use from a crab. I mean, yes, you can make uh, stock from it, but let's say we're not going to make stock or we don't use crab stock on our menu, okay? So we we uh, 
we clean or we pull all the meat out of this crab, which is very little, and let's say we're only left over with 50 grams of crab. What's the yield for our crab in this case? So everyone put this into your calculator. Yeah, it's 16.66 repeated percent. This means that only 16% of our crab was usable. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about yield percentages before we continue? All right. Sip of water. So now we're going to use this is where the yield becomes important. Okay. The yield is important as I had mentioned before, because as the amount of a product is decreasing, holding the original cost the same, the cost per unit must increase. Okay, so we can use the yield to calculate the edible portion cost or the edible uh, cost per unit. Okay, and how we do that is to take the as purchase cost or your APC. And then you divide it by your yield percentage. And that gives you the price per unit or the cost per unit that takes into consideration the yield. Okay, we're going to do a little example here. Okay, um, let's say let's say uh, do, 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 do. let's say we pay thirty dollars. Okay for a bag of onions, okay? And then in that, uh, in that uh, bag of onions, let's say there's, uh, let's say there's six kilograms of onions, okay? Let's also say that our onions, what kind of, what kind of, per, uh, we already talked about this, let's say an onion has a 90% yield, okay? If we take, uh, Let's calculate the edible cost per, per kilogram here. So your EPC, which is your edible portion cost, or the, co the cost of the edible portion, okay? If we take uh, the, what is it called? Let's, we have to calculate, first we have to calculate the, um, the as, purch as purchase cost per kilogram. And how we would do that is take the $30 uh, price, divide it by your six kilograms. Okay, because there's six kilograms in the bag. What is the as purchased cost per kilogram in this case? So we're taking thirty dollars and dividing it by uh, six kilograms. Yeah, we get five. In this example, we get five dollars uh, per kg. Now, this is not the true cost per kilogram. Okay, because it does not take into consideration the ninety percent yield. Okay, so let's apply the, the, the formula here. Our as purchase cost per kilogram is $5 per kg, okay, and we have a 90% yield, so we're going to divide it by 0 0.9. What is our edible portion cost in this case? So we're taking 5 kilograms and dividing by 0 0.9 or 5 divided by 0 0.9. Yeah, exactly, Farnaz. It's, it's 5.5. Well, it's 5.5 repeated. Okay, so our, our true cost per kilogram, or our EPC in this case, is $5.55. Now, you'll notice that it is higher than your as-purchase cost per kilogram. The reason for this is because this product has a yield that is less than 10%. Any time a product has a yield of than 100%, the EPC is always going to be higher than the APC. Again, because the amount of the product is decreasing, because it has a yield, holding the original cost the same, the cost per unit, in this case kilogram, must increase. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about how to calculate your edible cost per kilogram or your EPC?
Right. So you can use um, the yield percentages to understand how much you need to purchase. Okay. If you know the number of portions that you need to make and the portion size of those portions and divide it by the yield percentage, it'll give you the quantity that you need to purchase in order to make that amount of portions at that portion size. Okay. Um, this is used primarily in catering. Okay, I don't think a whole lot of people use this uh, in actual purchasing, which is what we talked about last week. But if you're doing doing catering, this will help uh, quite a bit. Okay, in telling you exactly how much you need to purchase. However, just because it tells you you need to purchase, uh, you know, 600 grams of onions, you still have to buy buy the bag or buy the case at the store. So there is limitations to using this particular uh, equation. Do, do, do. Now we're going to talk about, actually, before we talk about some cost factors, how are we feeling? We want to take a quick 15-minute break, and then we'll continue. All right, yeah, so let's take a break, okay? So we're going to take a quick 15-minute break, grab a coffee, grab something to eat. It is noon, okay? So let's take a quick break. Uh, it is now 12.46. Let's be back at 1.01. All right, that'll give us 15 minutes. So have a great break, and I'll see you back at 1.01.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Hope everyone had a good break and had a chance to refill their their water or coffee and maybe get a little nibble to eat. So now we're going to talk about uh, cost factors. Okay, cost factors are can be useful um, in uh, in calculating uh, portion costs and EPCs as uh, suppliers price changes right so we, we know based on last week that sometimes prices for product go up prices for products go down and that does um, because that's the as purchase cost it does have an effect on our portion cost okay our portion cost uh, is the portion size of a particular portion multiplied by the cost per usable kilogram, okay, and the cost per usable kilogram takes into consideration the yield for the product. So your the cost for uh, the cost per usable kilogram is the EPC, okay, that we've we've shown how to calculate. Okay, how we calculate our cost factor per kilogram is we take our cost our EPC or our cost per usable kilogram and divide it by the purchase price per kilogram. Okay. Um, then if we know this, then we can calculate the new, uh, we, we can calculate the new EPC if our supplier price changes by taking that cost factor per kilogram and multiplying it, okay, multiply it by the new supplier price per kilogram. We can also do something similar with the portion cost for a particular product, okay, by calculating first the uh, cost factor per portion. We take the portion cost for a particular uh, product and then we divide it by the purchase price per kilogram. Once we do that, we get the cost factor per portion and we can calculate the new portion cost for a particular product if the supplier's price changes by taking the cost factor per portion and multiplying that by the new uh, cost per, per kilogram. Okay. Um, uh, fairly useful, okay, um, for products that are not really expensive, okay, because if the product is really expensive, you should really be doing a, a cooking loss test or a butcher test to arrive at the yield and the standard pour cost, okay. Um, you can use these cost factors, I mean, sure. Um, it, it's, in my opinion, it's a lot easier just to do the quick math. You know, first you calculate your APC. Then you calculate your EPC, and then you can very easily calculate your portion cost, right? So you don't necessarily have to go through all this work. It may be easier just to do those three steps, okay? Um, on here. So look, this is what a cooking loss test looks like, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, this is a cooking loss test for uh, a prime rib, okay? Now, when we cook a prime rib, a lot of things are happening to that prime rib while we cook it, okay? The prime rib is actually uh, losing weight because we're cooking it. Uh, some of this is, is fat that is rendering out, okay? And uh, just any moisture, really, so various liquids, okay? And based on this, uh, all of these things leaving the prime rib, when we take the prime rib out of the oven, it's going to be smaller, right? So we need to take into consideration all the things that are leaving the prime rib when we cook it in order to calculate the portion cost, okay? Here we have the original weight, okay? So our, let's say our prime rib weighed uh, 5.6 kilograms, okay? Uh, let's say the, our cost per kilogram was ori uh, originally $9.29. Okay, which means that our entire prime rib cost is 52 bucks. So we're just multiplying those two okay, to, to arrive at the original cost. Let's say we cook the prime rib. So we, we, we tie it. Uh, we put some, some mustard on it or, yeah, you know, grainy mustard. And we put it in the oven. We bake it at a specific temperature for a specific amount of time. And then we lose some liquid. Okay, so we lose, we have some long cooking. Okay, in this case, we lost... Uh, 2.354 kilograms in in um, in cooking it, okay, which means that it has a cooked weight of 
3.246 kilograms. Okay, and that's that's 5.6 for the original weight, subtracting the loss in cooking. Okay, so this is what our prime rib weighs now that it's ready to be uh, sliced and served to guests. Okay. What we can also do with the cooking loss test is show each item, uh, in this case the loss in cooking and the cooked weight, as a percentage of the original weight. Okay, and you're just you're just dividing by the original weight. Okay, so in this case, um, forty. Uh, in this case, we lost uh, forty-two percent of our prime rib in cooking it, and how we can calculate that is by taking uh, two point three five four, which is the loss in cooking and we divide it by 5.600, which is the original weight, okay? We can do something very similar with the cooked weight. In this case, uh, now that our prime rib is now cooked and ready to be sliced or shaved and, and served to guests, it weighs 50% of the original weight, okay? And how we calculated that, in this case, was taking 3.246 and dividing it by the original weight again. Okay, and then we'll get the 58%. Now that the prime rib is now cooked and ready to serve to guests, it is 58% of the original weight. This is the yield of our prime rib. So in, uh, for this particular example, the yield for our prime rib was 58%. Okay. We can now, we can now uh, cost uh, the edible portion cost. Okay. If we take the original cost, I'm just going to erase this for a second. Um, we can calculate the, the EPC or the as purchase cost by taking the original total cost and dividing it by the cooked weight or the uh, the usable uh, portion of it, right? So here we take 52, $52 and divide it by 3.246. Okay, so put that in your, in your calculator and see if you got the same thing as I did. So take $50 and divide it by 3.246. Uh, what do you get? Exactly, Matthew. We get 16.01, which is uh, right here. Okay, that is our EPC. All right, that is our edible cost per kilogram. Now we know we know what our edible cost per kilogram is. Let's say we have we serve a 200 gram portion of prime rib. Okay, recall that calculating the portion cost is taking the portion size. And then multiplying it by the uh, cost, uh, the edible portion cost. So I'm just going to erase that for a second. Okay. So in this case, our EPC is equal to 16.06, which is or 02. Uh, apologies, which is right here. Okay. And the portion size. is 200 grams. Now our EPC is in kilograms because this is $16.02 per kg, okay? But our portion size is in grams. We have to convert our portion size to kilograms in order to calculate the portion cost, okay? So our portion cost is to the EPC multiplied by the portion size In this case, our EPC is, I think I've said that like a million times today. Um, our EPC is $16.02 per kg. Now, what is 200 grams converted to kilograms? Exactly. I'm really happy you all know that. <laughs> it's 0 0.2. So everybody in your calculator uh, put $16.02 and multiply it by 0 0.2. What do you get? Exactly, right here. We get the portion cost. Okay. Again, we're multiplying uh, 
16.02 by 0 0.2. And we get the cost uh, proportion of $3.02. So that means that every uh, whenever you're selling this particular uh, loin of prime rib in 200 gram servings, it's going to cost you $3.20. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this illustration or the inner workings of the cooking loss test? And one one final comment before I, I continue is again uh, I'm just going to erase this. Can I erase this, everybody? Is everybody good if I if I get rid of my inked up stuff? Awesome. There we go. So I had mentioned that the portion cost or the cost of the ingredients that go into the the dishes that were made create a recipe cost, and the cost of each dish has implications into pricing, has implications into CVP and break even as a result of that. And <clears throat> now these are these are very important things because our prices create our revenue, right? And as an extension, you know, our profit. CVP tells us when we break even, which is important to know. Now, if we did not do this cooking loss test, we would assume that our cost per kilogram for our prime rib was $9.29. We would base pricing decisions off of $9.29. Okay. However, that is not the true cost per kilogram because it has a yield. It has a 58% yield, which means that our... Uh, EPC or our true cost per kilogram is sixteen dollars and two cents. Okay, so we have to make sure that we're doing a cooking loss test for our high price items or items that don't have a consistent yield, because uh, it affects our our revenue and, as an extension, our profit, but also our break even points. So here's a butcher test, or an illustration of one anyway. Uh, Nicholas, the 9.29 was the as-purchased cost per kilogram. So that's what we paid to get uh, that amount of uh, prime rib. Does that help? Awesome. So the butcher test, again, conducted for items that are, um, that are uh, what was it, apportioned before, uh, before, they're, uh, before they're cooked, okay? Uh, or pretty much anything that's butchered, so fish, things like that. Let's say, let's say we had a whole, let's say we had a lamb, okay, so we, we buy our lambs whole, I've never seen a whole lamb, let's say we buy our lambs whole, uh, and it weighs 8.5 kilograms, okay, let's also say that it cost us, that lamb cost us $222.79, that means our cost per kilogram, if we do the division, is $26.21. But we have to butcher our and clean our lamb. Okay? And this is just an example. This isn't terribly realistic, but it, it's, it's, a, it's an example. So let's say we butcher our lamb, you know, we take out some bones, some innards, uh, things we can't use. I'm not sure if lambs have, they have hooves, I'm quite sure, but I'm not sure if they have horns. I don't think so. I should really watch more Discovery Channel. Let's say we we clean our lamb and we pull out 1.258 kilograms worth of whatever. That's hooves, fur, fat, bones, stuff like that. Um, it means that our now that our lamb has been cleaned, it only weighs 7.242 kilograms. This is all very similar to the cooking loss test. Okay, for example, the the uh, the trimmed weight is the original weight minus the loss in trimming. And we want to show, ooh, how'd that happen? We want to show the percentage of each item. So in this case, we lost 15% in, in cleaning the lamb, which means that our lamb now only weighs 85%. We only have 85% of our whole lamb left. Okay, this means that our, our, our lamb has a yield 
of 85%. Okay? If we know the original cost and we divide it by, so the original cost was $222.79, and we divide it by the trimmed weight, so in this case it's 7.242 kilograms, what do you get? Put that into your calculator. Yeah, you get three uh, thirty dollars and seventy six cents, which is your final cost per kilogram, but also your EPC or your edible uh, cost proportion or edible cost per kilogram. Now, very similar to the cooking loss test, if we know the portion size and the EPC, we can calculate the cost of that size of portion. So in this case, the portion uh, that we serve our lamb, again, this is just a hypothetical example, is uh, 200, okay? Would it be the same if we took 26.21 and divided it by 0 0.85? Uh, likely, yeah, absolutely it would. So that's the as purchase cost divided by the yield. You'd get the same EPC, yep. Uh, so let's do that now. Take 200 grams and multiply it uh, by an EPC of $30.76 per kilogram. Keeping in mind, you need to convert the, those grams to, to kilograms. What do you get? Well, I, I get $6.15. That is the cost of a 200 gram uh, portion of our lamb that takes into consideration the 85% yield. So that's the portion cost. Does anybody have any questions about the butcher test before I continue? No problem at all, Francis. And yes, this one's being recorded. Awesome. So we should continue. So you, as I've noted, uh, the, the cooking loss test and the butcher test have so many similarities. We're essentially, uh, we're essentially measuring, uh, you know, what's leaving the product. For example, when we butcher something, it's, it's bones and it's fat. We're measuring how much fat and bones we're taking out of the product to make it usable and calculating the yield and knowing a particular portion size calculating the portion cost. It's the exact same thing with the cooking loss test except the, the, the only difference is what's leaving the product. For example, at a cooking loss test we're not, we're not losing any bones with those products, we're losing volume, right? So, we're, but we're doing the same thing. We're just calculating the usable portion, the, uh, the EPC, the yield, and the portion cost. Now, if you take these two things and you smash them together, okay, so if you, you add the two tests together, it creates what we call a yield test, okay? A yield test is pretty much is, is just a cooking loss test and a butcher test put together in order to find the portion cost for something that needs to be both butchered and then portioned after it's cooked, okay? So some... Um, some examples of this would be uh, prime rib, okay? That's pretty much my, not the, that's the example I use for the most part, right? We have to butcher a prime, uh, we have to not, not necessarily butcher, we have to clean a prime rib of, of, of fat and bones and stuff. And then we also have to cook it and it loses volume in cooking, right? So we would perform a yield test on prime rib or PR. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, fairly fairly simple and straightforward. It's just taking the two uh, tests and smashing them together on one form. Okay, and that's what the that's the worksheet that we're going to be doing today, because to practice a yield test is to practice a, well a yield test, but also a cooking loss test and a butcher test. Now standardized yields. Okay, all of the tests that we've talked about uh, prior to this slide, so the cooking loss test, the butcher test, the yield test, that gives you a super accurate measurement of a product yield. Okay, as I've been all along, we want to do these tests with high cost items because a small change in a yield percentage will have a, a drastic effect on your cost proportion. Okay, and as an extension, your, your EPC. But there are many products that do not cost very much or do not cost as much as a whole lamb or uh, a loin of prime rib or a whole salmon or a whole tuna, right? Uh, things like eggs do obviously don't cost as much as those, uh, those items. Uh, broth, well, the broth would be a bad example. Um, peppers, right? So we don't necessarily need to do a cooking loss test or a butcher test or a yield test on those items like uh, an onion or a carrot or uh, things like that because they don't cost very much right it won't the yield does not have uh, nearly as big of an impact on the cost of those products oh. so a standardized yield is a yield that you've identified as consistent for a specific product right an in-house yield using one of the tests that we just talked about okay Standardized yields have advantages in some cases over in-house yield tests because uh, they're standardized and they're fairly accurate, right? For example, with, with a reasonable amount of um, certainty, you can say an onion is going to have like a 90% yield, okay? Even if it's 92% for a specific onion, it's not going to affect the cost of your products much, okay? Because it is a low-cost uh, item, okay? However, you should be using in-house yields or yield tests for your high cost items, like I've been saying all along, your prime rib, your salmons, your tunas, things like that, okay? But for your low cost items, using standardized yields is just fine, okay? It's, it's okay even to guesstimate, okay? But you, you can go online uh, and you can, um, you just go to Google, you type in standardized yields, uh, for food products, and you'll, there's a bunch of different resources uh, that you can use to uh, get, gather or understand what a standardized yield for a particular product might be. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about standardized yields? Or when to use them, I suppose? Yeah, it's for cheap items. Yeah, like your that's it's your it's your onions, it's your carrots, it's your peppers, it's your uh, your bananas or things like that, right? But for 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 big expensive items, you want to use the in-house yield tests. <clears throat> so there's, I mean, while the 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 using in-house uh, yield tests uh, help us understand. You know, um, you know the the cost of our the true cost of our products. There are other things that can happen in the food production area or like your prep area that's going to affect your your cost proportion. Okay, um, if people if your products aren't using your standardized recipes or your standardized uh, recipe cooking times, um, it's going to affect the yield of your product. For example. Um, I don't know, uh, prime rib. We used to sell a ton of prime rib. You have to cook it uh, early in the afternoon for it to be ready. Exactly. Also depends if if uh, uh, if your employees are trained properly or uh, brand new or experienced. Absolutely. Um, I have one time uh, coached me on the way I clean peppers. What I normally do with the pepper, and I don't know why he, I thought, I, I thought it was perfectly fine. How I how I clean the pepper is I chop off the top, remove the stem, and then pull out the inside of the pepper, and then I cut it from there, right? Like I, I would julienne it from there, or I would uh, I don't know if you can chop the pepper, but 
I would Julian it after I've cleaned it like that. And he coached me on it because he said, you're not getting the full yield from the pepper. And uh, I mean, that, that was probably because I'm not a cook. Uh, I don't know. I thought I did okay. I don't know why he coached me on it. Anywho, yeah, Mackenzie, you're really right. But uh, there was another case where I had a, a prep cook put a prime rib, a loin of prime rib, into the oven, uh, and it, it was in there. Like we're, you're only supposed, we were supposed to cook prime rib for I think it was like four hours, and he cooked it for six. So when it came out of the oven, it was well done, right? Uh, when it's well done, oh, quite a bit of that liquid. If, any, if everyone's had a well done anything, you know, it, it could be quite tough. A lot of the reason for that is all of the fat is gone, and all of the volume is gone. So uh, when you do that, it affects the yield, right? Yeah, I, mean, uh, I don't know. It, it depends. I'm not a big. I'm not a big guy. I, I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, but when my my family would make prime rib, they would always cook it well, but it was always fairly juicy. I don't. But then uh, I, in the in the restaurant, it was always cooked medium rare. So I, I don't know the discrepancies, but anyway, uh, over portioning, okay, will affect the cost per portion. Obviously, even if the the yield is not affected, right? If you put if your if your uh, portion size for uh, a portion of rice is 100 grams, and your 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 prep cooks or your cooks um, are are prepping 120 gram portions of rice, well, the cost per portion is going to go up. Right, you can say the same for under portioning. Okay, under portioning will means you know not putting as much of a product in a portion that they should be, and when people do that, uh, the customers may notice. Right, for example, in my example with the um, the the salad with the uh, Instead of getting a four ounce salmon on their salad, they got a four ounce. Uh, instead of getting a four ounce salmon on their salad, they got a two ounce salmon. Okay, this is an example of under portioning, and it will likely affect the guest experience. Right. All in all, consistency is key to success in food service. Every time your customers come back or come to your restaurant, they should be and they order the same dish because they like it and they love it. They should be getting the same dish every single time. Okay, that will keep your customers coming back. Okay, that only happens if your cooks follow your standard recipes, standard portion sizes, which create for you a standard portion cost from which you can measure how good or poor your food cost is. Just some key terms that we've already talked about. I don't know what the rest of this is. Oh, it's just copyrights and stuff. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is we're going to I'm going to I'm going to do a tutorial of a of a yield test. Okay, so I'm going to quickly explain the worksheet. Okay, and then I'm going to go and do each column uh, uh, separately so that I can come back to the chat and see if you have any questions. Okay, does anybody have any questions before I continue? Right on, right on. So I'm going to share my screen, explain uh, a little bit about the yield test and what it looks like, and then I'm going to complete the first column. After I've completed the first column, I'm going to come back to, to the chat and see if you have any questions. So please hold your questions until I come back. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Application window. Uh, where is it? So give me 30 seconds here. Okay. Share application. There we go. All right. So here's a yield test. Okay. This whole thing is a yield test. This is a yield test for a prime rib. Okay. Or a, yeah, beef prime rib. Uh, you have all of the items uh, for the the test. You'll notice that the first portion of the yield test is actually the is actually the the uh, butcher test, and then the last part. Oops, don't want to do that. The last part of the uh, of the yield test is the cooking loss test. So again, these are just two tests that have been smashed together. Okay. So first, we want to calculate 
the the weight of the prime rib. Okay, so all of these are given to us. We have to calculate uh, the yellow cells. So our prime rib weighed 8.5 kilograms when it came into us, uh, into the restaurant. Let's say we trimmed it up, so we took off some fat, we pulled out some bones, and we pulled out 1.258 kilograms of fat and bones. This means that our, if we take the original weight and subtract the loss in trimming, that our trimmed weight, or the weight of the prime rib now that it's been trimmed, is now 7.2 four two kilograms okay so we've trimmed up our prime rib it's ready to be marinated or whatever we slather on some marinade i don't know guys and then we put it into the oven okay we're going to have some loss in cooking so that's again volume that's leaving the prime rib either uh fat uh, rendering out or other juices uh evaporating okay if we take the trimmed weight Subtract the loss in cooking, we get the cooked weight. In this case, the cooked weight is 4.888 kilograms. This means that now that our, our prime rib has come out of the oven, it now weighs that amount of kilograms. But let's say we, we forgot to take out a bone, okay? So there's maybe there's some additional bones and trim that we have to take out of the prime rib. Okay? In this case, there's 0 0.581 kilograms. This means that the total sellable weight of our prime rib now that it's been cleaned, cooked, and then cleaned again is 4.307 kilograms. Okay, so it started off as 8.5, it now weighs 4.307 kilograms. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and come see if you have any questions. Do, do, do. Do we have any questions? Oh, people just following along. Awesome. Very good. So everyone's good with that the first part? Awesome. So the next step that we're going to do is we're calculating the percentage of each of those items. So the loss in trimming, the, uh, the loss in cooking, the, the cooked weight, the trimmed weight. And how we do that is take each item yeah I'm just I'm just putting a quick equation up on the board here there we go we're taking each item or each line item and then dividing it by the original weight okay um, and that's what we're doing for the next column so I'm going to share my screen now and show you how to how to apply that Awesome. So right here we're doing the, the ratio to weight percentages. So we know that the original weight is always 100% because it's the original weight. We're calculating, we're just taking each line item, in this case it's the loss in trimming, dividing it by the original weight, and we're getting the percentage of each line item. Okay. So this means that we lost 15% of our prime rib in trimming it, and our, now that it's been trimmed, it now weighs 85%. Okay. It also means that we, we lost 28% in cooking it, and also that our another prime rib has come out of the oven. It now weighs 58% of the original weight. Okay. It also means, now that we've taken out the additional bones and trim, that the total sellable weight, or the actual yield of our prime rib, is only 51%. So we take the 4.307, divide by the original weight, and the yield for our prime rib in this case is 51%. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm, I'm going to see if you have any questions about that particular portion. How's everybody doing? Fairly straightforward? Awesome. I'm just going to take a quick, quick uh, sip of water. There it is. So next, we're going to be calculating the cost per kilogram at various stages of our, you know, preparing our prime rib. And how we do that is we take the original cost. And divide by the number of kgs. 
okay? Because we're getting the, the cost per kilogram, okay? But first, we have to calculate the original cost. So I'm going to share my screen now and show you how to do it. There we go. So first, we have to calculate the total uh, or original cost. And how we do that is we multiply the original weight by the original cost per kilogram. So the original, or sorry, the, yeah, the original total cost of our prime rib was $222.79. But as we've trimmed it and cooked it, our, the weight of our prime rib has changed. Because the weight has changed, it's affected the cost per kilogram. So after we've trimmed our, uh, or butchered our prime rib, we take the original cost, divide it by the remaining amount of kilograms, after we trimmed our uh, prime rib, the cost per kilogram has increased to $30.76. Okay, we also cooked it. So to calculate the uh, cost per kilogram after we had cooked it, we take again the original cost and divide it by the, the remaining kilograms. Okay, in this case, after we cooked it, our prime rib now cost $45.58 per kilogram. And then lastly, now that our prime rib is ready to be served to guests, it's been trimmed, it's been cooked, our, prime, our cost per kilogram is equal to the original cost divided by the remaining amount of kilograms. In this case, our true cost per kilogram, or our EPC, is $51.73 sorry, seventy-three cents per kilogram. Okay, um, We can now... If you want to check to make sure you did you did all your math right, if you multiply the remaining amount of kilograms by the new cost per kilogram, you should get the same the same value. Okay, and now you can calculate the cost per portion. So let's say our portion size is 200 grams for a, a piece of prime rib. Okay, if we take the cost per kilogram and multiply it by the portion size, in this case we have to convert the 200 grams to gr uh, kilograms, so 0 0.2, we get a cost per 200 gram portion of prime rib of $10.35. Okay? And that's how you complete a yield test. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and come back and see if you have any questions. How are we doing? Fairly straightforward? All right, and now that I, 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 I don't really have much else to go over today, does anybody have any questions at all about anything that I can help answer before we conclude today's class? If you're all good, uh, throw a thumbs up in the chat. Awesome, yes, Matthew, do you have a question? Oh, okay. Sorry, I saw your hand was raised there. There we go. All right. Very good. So that was um, – that's how we calculate uh, the portion cost for products, okay, that take into consideration the as-purchase cost, the yield percentage, and if we, if we sum up or add all of our portion costs – for a particular dish together, it gives us the recipe cost, which is what we'll be going over and practicing, or what you will be, uh, the week after intercession with uh, Chef Matus. Okay, so that's all I have. It's been awesome uh, uh, teaching the group, all very bright, and um, you all did very well. I'm, I'm quite pleased with everybody. And if anybody, if if nobody has any other questions, um, have an awesome weekend. Uh, have an awesome intercession, a very well deserved break, and um, and yeah, the what about the test? Which test? Uh, you mean the test after, like after intercession? This chapter, yeah. So let me uh, let me just double check. Why did my eye be? Uh, where did I put that? Do 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 do. 
Nope. Uh, your the test number six is uh, open on this material is open between November 9th and November thirteenth. There is uh, no test during intercession. Does that help uh, answer both of your questions? That's correct, Matthew. Absolutely. Okay. And if you have, a, if anyone's having any questions about when the tests are and when they're not, if you go to the important course information tab near the bottom, your your testing schedule is there. That's the dates where all of these are are open. All right. Right on. Well, again, like I said, if there's no other questions, uh, it was awesome uh, teaching you. I'll, pr I'll probably have, I might have you again, uh, either through human resources, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, if you're going into the bridge. And uh, yeah, so everyone, again, have an awesome weekend, a well-deserved uh, break. And, uh, and thank you very much. We're looking forward to getting wedding. And uh, yeah, you stay safe as well, Luca. And uh, everyone have an awesome, uh, an awesome time. Thank you very much. You as well, Kevin. Thank you. You as well. Thank you.